Okay, welcome everybody. So this is the first CCSA talk. I know most of you who are here with us today, they know what the CCSA is, but as we are going to upload it on YouTube, I would like to briefly introduce what the CCSA is. So it is a cooperation between the Art, Hins Art History Institute of the Goethe University, the architecture department of the Technical University of Darmstadt and the German Architecture Museum with the DIM. And since our foundation in 2017, the group has grown actually a lot. So I would like to mention who is behind the, the CCSA, the Center for Critical Studies in Architecture. So from the Goethe University, there is Carsten Ruhe, Markus Daus, Daniela Ortiz dos Santos, Moritz Rüger and Jennifer Dijk. And from the Technical University of Darmstadt, there is Christiane Seige, Anna Maria Meister, Christiane Fülscher, Lisa Beiswanger, Leonie Lube, and myself. And from the German Architecture Museum, there is the curator Oliver Elser, who's also with us here today. Um, last year, a big research project started, the Architectures of Order. It is funded by the Löwe program. And in the course of this research project, Zara Bure and Chris Dana joined our team. And the architectures of orders, they are doing a lot of interesting lectures and um, symposia and conferences. So I invite you to check out their webpage. It's architecturesoforder.org. The CCSA has also done lecture series. We started in 2017 with the lecture series, Architecture System and Order. Then came the Bauhaus lectures for two semesters, and we had the Max Becher project in 2018-2019, which was a student exhibition, a symposia, and also a book publication. We also have colloquia um, for graduate students and for PhD students, but we as the CCSA team, we felt the need to have a smaller format where we could present our own research, our own book publication, publications and also to invite people we think are crucial for our research. So this is how the CCSA talks started and this is the first one and I'm really happy. And you can see the poster and you see that every month we have one talk. We start today with Igor Demchenko. Then in November, Christiane Fülscher is going to present her book Deutsche Botschaften zwischen Anpassung und Abgrenzung. And she will discuss it together with Monika Wagner and Victoria von Gaudecker. In December, I myself, I will speak with Stefan Trüby about fascism and architecture and if it is a debate which is coming up again and again. And in January, Theresa Fankenel is going to present her book Plexiglas und Kameras, Theodore Konrad, Louis Checkman und der New Yorker Architektur Modell Boom. I always want to say Architektur Modellbau Boom, but it's Architektur Modell Boom, 1950 to 1970. And she will discuss it together with Anna Maria Meister and Oliver Elsa from the DRM. So this is all what I wanted to say. I'm happy we start now and I hand over to Anna Maria Meister. Thank you so much. Um, I will now introduce our guest today, which is a special honor because he's also um, a DRD guest lecturer at our um, chair, uh, Architecture Theory and Science. So all the more um, welcome to this talk. And I'm also really happy that we have this series because it's a um, way for all of us, not, not only to, to discuss research, but to expand it and to get feedback and to kind of get into it. So Dr. Igor Demchenko got his uh, doctoral degree in architectural history from the uh, MIT and has taught history and historic uh, preservation at several schools, such as the Illinois Institute of Technology, the School of Architecture um, and Preservation in, uh, at Columbia University, or the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, his research has been supported by many institutions such as the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies, the Kunsthistorische Institute in Florence, the KHI, 
or at a Swiss Government Excellence Scholarship, the Canadian Center for Architecture, the Aga Khan program, for, and the list goes on. So his work has been funded by many and um, awarded by many and looks at, um, on the one hand, theoretical problems of modern architecture conservation practices, uh, some of which we might hear today. Um, and uh, he also addresses questions of non-Western architectural expertise and the history of regional planning in the former socialist bloc. So we are super excited to have you here launching the series, let's say, and um, we're looking forward to your presentation. And after the presentation, there will be time for discussion and questions. So we'd love to hear everybody's thoughts. And until then, we would say everybody switch off their camera, mute yourself and uh, enjoy the ride. And then we'll moderate the questions after. Uh, should I start? All right, so I'll share. Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to thank uh, CSA for inviting me, uh, for allowing me to present my research. Uh, what I will share with you today is uh, largely research in progress. Um, and therefore, I will refer to my presentation a lot. Um, as many things uh, can be understood only from uh, the diagrams and from uh, the maps that are included in the presentation. Uh, also, I will share with you fairly long quotes from uh, the archival materials that my presentation is based on. Uh, that's the way for me to uh, both uh, show, share the spirit of uh, the preservation activities uh, and uh, that uh, the, the way they were uh, run at the period that I'm looking at, but also uh, certain um, um, factual data uh, as well. So um, the uh, materials that the stock is based on uh, were shared with me uh, by Israeli Antiquities Authority, to which I'm also really generous. Uh, but this stock has also almost nothing to do with Israel. Uh, it's a different period, although the region is the same. Uh, also, it's not really intended as a criticism of uh, British administration in Palestine, of which I'm certainly critical, but as a study of um, uh, the constitutive dynamics of the commodification of uh, cultural heritage. So this is the case of intentional commodification of monuments under the colonial conditions. <clears throat> In my talk uh, chronologically and geographically is focused on uh, the British mandate in Palestine. That's a period uh, between uh, 1920 and 1948 when um, the former uh, Ottoman territories in Palestine uh, came under control uh, of uh, the British Empire. Uh, more specifically, uh, it is uh, focused on a small town in the north uh, of uh, the Mandate territory, uh, the town of Accra here. Uh, it's slightly north of Haifa. Uh, um, so Accra has an interest in history, or Accra as it's called now in Israel, uh, Accra in Arabic, uh, it was, uh, it's, it's an old settlement which uh, for a short period in its history uh, was the uh, capital city for the Crusaders uh, in um, the Holy Land. And uh, then uh, they were expelled. Uh, the town uh, declined considerably and I was rebuilt by the Ottomans. So what you see now on the screen uh, is mostly the Ottoman period 
um, uh, settlement, uh, which means 18th and the 19th century, the 18th and the 19th century, uh, but under uh, the Ottoman period settlement uh, is located uh, the Crusaders, which would be 12th century uh, town, uh, and it's been excavated, but at the uh, now, and uh, it's now the main object of tourism in Akka, uh, the underground ruins of the Crusaders town. But at the time when uh, that I am covering the uh, mandate uh, period, uh, the British mandate period, uh, it was still largely unknown uh, or unexcavated. Uh, only uh, small parts of those underground ruins were revealed. Um, <clears throat> the focus of this talk is this document, or the foundation, the primary basis of this talk is this document. Uh, it's uh, known as Winter Report uh, after uh, the name of the person who put it together, uh, Percy Winter. Uh, the report was produced in 1944. Um, Percy Winter, uh, you can see him on the screen too, uh, is the only picture I could find of his. Uh, he lived between 1899 uh, and 1966, uh, British, worked in Palestine. Um, nothing, not much, it was much, that much that I could really find about him. Um, so, why was this report produced and what were its goals? And for, for that, I will quote a small piece from the memorandum of the Reconstruction Commission, uh, the memorandum to the government, which was produced in July 1943. And I quote, Accra is a place deserving of special treatment as probably the most beautifully situated town in Palestine and as one of its finest architectural and archeological monuments. If, as I hope it will do, government takes energetic steps after the war to encourage tourist traffic with a view of stimulating visible experts, Accra should gain a new importance as an outstanding attraction for tourists. So uh, during World War II, uh, the administration of uh, British Palestine was planning for uh, the uh, future economic rehabilitation of its colony. And um, uh, that report uh, essentially is a large scale plan uh, for uh, the steps that uh, the government uh, or its experts rather thought that uh, need to, uh, that are needed to be made uh, to um, uh, make uh, the town an attractive tourist destination. Um, <clears throat> so here is uh, uh, the scope of uh, uh, the report. It's a, an extensive document with multiple illustrations, but also with uh, uh, lots of topics covered, uh, both technical and uh, somewhat more theoretical, and I'm uh, more interested, obviously, in the latter. Um, uh, although uh, the town was um, considered as a uh, potential, uh, potential source of income, as they call it, uh, visual experts, uh, there were the, the document expresses certain reservations about how uh, this place can be attractive to the tourists and what stands on, on the way of attracting tourists in its current condition. And again, I will give you a long quote and it uh, will hopefully show you what kind of thinking was behind this uh, document. So I quote, it cannot be expected by the wave of the wand of a wand for a people accustomed from time immemorial to dirt, squalor, and most elementary habits of life to transmogrify themselves into clean living appreciative tenants. 
on their removal from slum-like conditions and to clean modern sanitary surroundings or into reconditioned and enlarged dwellings provided with modern sanitary arrangements. This is a process which must be preceded by education and social instruction for a considerable length of time. In England, it is considered that the process spreads over at least two generations. During this time, maintenance housing must be expected to be very heavy, but efficient and ready maintenance will be a necessity. Good maintenance is in itself a form of visual education for the enlightened tenant, but more important still, Without insistence upon good maintenance, the tenants would quickly win the battle of the standards. Uh, for battle, it will be for some long time. So essentially, the biggest problem to converting uh, Accra or Accra into a thriving tourist destination, the problem commodifying it for uh, tourism, for cultural tourism, uh, tourist consumption uh, were, were the people, as uh, Percy Winter and other experts working for uh, the government, for the British government in Palestine saw it. Uh, and to solve this problem, uh, when Percy Winter proposed uh, the urban planning methods, to use the urban planning methods. Uh, his approach uh, to urban planning was in old, in old um, historic towns was as follows. And again, I quote, town planning is not really an art. Rather, it is an abstract science, the purpose of which is not primarily to create effects, but to establish correct numerical and spatial relationship between the various elements that compose a town open spaces, buildings, and services, so that the whole is properly balanced and capable of working efficiently. And um, he also says, a town is in a way like a big house. It has its workspace and living space, recreation space and movement space. The problem as in a house is to find the right amount of space and the proper place for each so that life can be lived happily and fully without friction and with relative prosperity. Uh, so, the, so the, that's the goal, to redistribute population so that it would look decent to the visitors. And um, to solve this problem, uh, Pursuant uh, deploys certain instruments certain analytical instruments. Uh, well, first of all, uh, it's the demographic analysis of uh, the uh, place. Uh, he, particular, he relied on previous censuses and also on a special ACRA census, which was conducted especially for this uh, uh, report in March, 1944. Um, it estimated uh, or rather collected the data about uh, the distribution of population. Uh, and then that data was uh, analyzed spatially through applying it to the maps of the old walled city, walled town. Um, the mapping was a crucial instrument for understanding what can be done to the town and how it can be uh, rearranged uh, to uh, create a, a favorable uh, impression or to, to create a favorable, to, to produce a favorable impression upon tourists. Um, so that's the most basic map, which only uh, shows uh, the, um, distribution of monuments and um, um, the uh, scope and uh, scale of uh, different quarters that existed at that time within uh, the town. The town was uh, partially Christian, partially Muslim in population, 
uh, and also there was a considerable difference in terms of income and uh, in terms of occupation within the world city. Now, there's another map um, which is uh, more focused on uh, smaller quarters and that uh, uh, was later used to show uh, the uh, actual density of population within uh, the um, within the uh, town, within the world city. Um, so what? Yes, and another uh, analytical instrument that Persewinter extensively used was the projection of uh, the trends from early censuses conducted conducted within the British, uh, by the British Mandate of Palestine, by the government of Brit the British Mandate of Palestine, uh, projection into the future. Uh, so he wasn't just collecting the data and uh, looking at how that data can uh, be distributed spatially, but he was also uh, in, uh, pr projecting the trends that he was discovering in the past into the future. That's it was important and you'll see one. Uh, so what does he discover? Uh, uh, well, first he discovered the relative overcrowding. On average, um, the, uh, there were uh, 1.6 rooms per household and 3.2 persons per room. Uh, well, the actual situation was more complicated also depending on um, uh, the quarter uh, and the income uh, in uh, every quarter. And then uh, on the other hand, so that, that, that's the negative side for him what, of what he discussed. The other hand, the re relatively compared to Jerusalem in particular low density, and here I will quote him. It is uh, surprising to find that despite the physical restrictions imposed by the walls, which uh, it would be expected to have resulted in intense development to the full of the precious land so enclosed. The percentage of unbuilt up area is so high indeed, it is higher than uh, for many a modern well-planned town of unrestricted area. On this basis of averages, there cannot be said to be undue density, even when making the unfair comparison with an open in a non-walled uh, town. Um, and then another thing uh, that he discovers, or not discovers, or rather um, projects, is the expected degradation of urban condition, conditions uh, based on the uh, trends that he uh, discovers. Uh, and then again, I will quote, Accra is predominantly Muslim. The mean average natural increase in the Muslim population of Palestine since 1931 is 28 people per thousand. It varies between 19.9 and 33.4 per thousand for years 1934 and 1930 and 1943 respectively. So um, he expects that uh, that trend will continue uh, and uh, he also informs his readers that the total increase of population between 1931 and 1942 was uh, 90% from 8,000, slightly more than 8,000 to uh, 15,500, uh, um, of which 38% uh, was the natural increase, the uh, high birth rate counted by the uh, Higher birth rate and 42, uh, 52 sorry, percent was migration from rural areas. Um, he again he interpreted that as a continuous process, continuous rise of population, continuous growth that will uh, that will extend into the future, and um, th then will result in a growing overpopulation of the town. Now, now we know that it's not the case. Uh, most probably it wouldn't be the case. 
uh, Accra was at the early stage of demographic transition and the process of demographic transition is shown on this diagram. Uh, it was at the moment when uh, the death rates were falling, but the birth rates were still uh, fairly high, both within the town, but also particularly in, in the um, rural areas surrounding it. So uh, the town had to sponge a lot of um, population that couldn't find um, jobs in the rural areas surrounded, surrounding it. Hence that inflow, considerable inflow of population. Uh, but what we, the model, the the more ex, the accepted model that we have now for the demographic tr transition predicted uh, that um, uh, at the third or particularly fourth stage, the um, birth rates will also would also start to fall, uh, to, uh, and then the death rates will continue falling, but that will result in the first uh, stabilization of the growth, then the end of the growth, and then even in the nature of the of population. All of that, that model was completely unknown to uh, Percy Winter, and he had a completely different vision of what is going to happen. And um, also he was extremely um, uh, um, cautious about the ability of existing economy and existing urban institutions to accommodate the uh, population flow, well, more skeptical even. Um, now, obviously we don't know if uh, that model would realize specifically in uh, uh, the, uh, if you can call it natural, uh, um, course of things uh, in the town was interrupted in 1948 by the creation of the State of Israel, the expulsion of uh, all its population, all its Arab population, mostly Lebanon, and then by repopulating it by uh, the rural population that in turn was uh, pushed out of the villages of Galilee and the areas surrounding Akko. Uh, so, uh, and then, um, uh, demographic behavior was significantly, of the new population was significantly different from the demographic behavior of uh, the population that was documented by uh, pursuant in uh, for 1944. Um, but anyway, uh, with that in mind, uh, with that dynamics, with uh, his understanding of the dynamics of um, uh, the demographic situation in Accra, Percy Winter proposed certain planning solutions uh, that uh, would solve what uh, he saw as a problem and would allow uh, the town to turn into a tourist destination, a uh, decent place for Western tourists. Uh, so his solution was first the normalization of social and family structure uh, of uh, the local population based on the British model. And uh, again, I will quote for him, uh, in that city, and now he compares, compares Accra to Birmingham in Britain, and that city Birmingham, the standards adopted to define overcrowding laid down that. Standard one, the house must allow of persons of opposite sex over 10 years of age and not living together as husband and wife to sleep in different rooms. And standard two, for any given number of rooms, the total number of persons should not exceed the permitted number. That is approximately two per room, counting each child between one and 10 years old as a half person and ignoring children under one year old. These standards are well reasoned and eminently desirable and indeed are dictated as the very minimum of any civilized community to ensure the barest human comfort, decency and respect of family life, no matter in what town or country or amongst what class of people. On this basis, it follows that if each family includes or may include at least one child, 
a practical certainty in Accra, then two rooms per family dwelling becomes the absolute minimum requirement. So he proposes that the standards of uh, living, the standards of distribution of population accepted in Britain should be forced upon Accra. Um, now, This map, the map that you now see on the screen, it uh, shows um, the areas, and that's important, marked by X, Y, and Z, that uh, uh, can, uh, that from his, from Perseverance's perspective, uh, could be redeveloped to rehouse population that is particularly dense, uh, densely packed within the other quarters marked by numbers. Uh, and um, uh, here, in the next slide, uh, what he proposes to do is um, different scenarios uh, that would allow to uh, redistribute population uh, by keeping most of the redistributed population within the walls, or uh, if, uh, if those uh, areas uh, are not actually developed, then to uh, build additional housing outside the walls of the town. Um, so you can see that uh, the strategies were, there were a number of strategies, uh, the, depending on the amount of investment that uh, the government of Palestine, the British government of Palestine was willing to put into this project. And, uh, all, but all of them uh, led, uh, led to uh, that increase of uh, density to the standards of uh, Birmingham that he considered uh, appropriate for a decent, uh, decently populated town. Now he, he had certain fears about uh, that project and uh, also certain elements of optimism. And again, I will quote from him, there has been revealed a tendency to find the panacea for the ills from which Old Town suffers, Old Town of Acre suffers by removing its population outside, tearing down its buildings, driving asphalted highways over it, uh, and eventually rebuilding what may remain according to standardized urban patterns, standard building lines and building heights, and to stamp the face of the town with a hallmark of public health distancing batteries of drain pipes. This tendency can be attributed to false reasoning on insufficient evidence and inappreciation of paramount considerations. Pursued to conclusions, it would result in the disappearance of Old Town, its traditional way of life, its character and its visual appearance as we know it. An efficiently laid out town might result, but that town would not be Accra. This tendency is reminiscent of the progressive school of the last century who simplified for themselves their problems of development by destroying irreplaceable expressions of our history and heritage. Fortunately, it is now understood that progress need not necessarily to go uh, hand in hand with destruction, accepting as axiomatic that so far as practicable, practicable old town must be preserved. It is not worthy how little need be destroyed how much, in fact, can be preserved. Well, and I come to my conclusions. Um, so the most general and perhaps somewhat um, cir circular reasoning conclusion that I have is that demographic planning is an important preservation instrument. Preservation is as much an operation over humans as over built structures. Uh, planning 
uh, as a preservation instrument. It's only marginally spatial. Its core is social science, statistics, and the mathematical analysis of uh, data. Uh, now, it's interesting also to know that Winter's plan and proceed from certain, if not always clearly outlined and acknowledged assumptions about the actual and uh, the desired trajectory of urban transformation uh, in the process of um, Palestine's modernization. Uh, and um, it's also worth noting that um, the desired outcome uh, is based on a certain important model uh, or, or certain ideal model that uh, arguably, and he doesn't mention that, but uh, I think that would be safe to assume is based on small uh, towns in Italy and Spain, which naturally uh, went into a certain demographic decline and um, uh, therefore became uh, somewhat of a I, ideal uh, historic destination. And that's that model is projected upon uh, the town in Palestine uh, and um, uh, is uh, created or intended to be created by uh, the instruments that uh, Perse Winter suggests that uh, deploys and suggests should be deployed. Um, the end of the, uh, also commenting on uh, his report on uh, his proposals uh, that they are based on the, uh, um, the, the that he actually uh, significantly misunderstood the actual trajectory of demographic development uh, of the town uh, but that is only natural because uh, the, uh, the, because of the development of social sciences and uh, he, for which he obviously could not account, but it's interesting how much he still uh, was learning from the, 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 the development of the uh, social science models available at that period. Um, and as a final statement, Winter Report, I believe, testifies to the combination of the following. So the uh, formation of the culture of consuming heritage or historic towns with its uh, positive and negative uh, pragmatic expectation, positive being certain care for uh, historic fabric and negative the expectation of uh, demographic decline or demographic contraction even. Uh, and it's interesting to note uh, the optimism uh, demonstrated by um, Percy Winter for the prognostic power of applied social sciences and uh, their mobilization by uh, the uh, capitalism for the heritage tourism economy or heritage tourism industry. And finally, uh, what makes this uh, case particularly interesting is the uh, scope of free hands that uh, Percy went ahead, uh, which probably he wouldn't in um, Britain, uh, where local people had a lot more agency, or at least local educated class had a lot more agency in terms of uh, how and what should be preserved. And in the case of Palestine, British controlled Palestine, that agency wasn't there, and he could, in certain ways, move. Uh, to the limits uh, of uh, uh, what what uh, he would like to, would have loved to do would have liked to do uh, without uh, any constraints. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I will jump back in, I think. Um, and I have many questions, as those who know me probably um, assume. So I will try to temper my questions and try to start to uh, get to a, con um, to a discussion. I have two, let's say, two and a half questions that I really want to ask, uh, and they have to do with each other. 
So I might just start with um, with one uh, or maybe with both. So in, in your example, I mean, you show all these maps and plans and how these kind of frictions and projections are happening. So, so in a way, one of my questions is if then the, the conclusion is that preservation is necessarily a local or should be necessarily a local practice. Because if you, the, the story you tell happened in a colonialist context, let's say, or a colonial context at least, um, where social assumptions of how to live a life were projected to a demographic and a city fabric that's very foreign to, the, to, to that kind of uh, projection. So then if we were to take this to the extreme, would that mean um, that only, let's say, locals can preserve their own culture and therefore their own demographic and their own um, built environment? Um, so so that's, that's one part. And the other part is, is, is then if we think this through, let's say politically and architecturally, um, is then the notion of preservation as we, as we define it now anyway, necessarily, let's say colonialist when coming not from the inside of a certain culture or time, but when projected, let's say. Because already in a way that the diagnosis that something needs to be preserved that comes from the outside has a kind of, let's say, colonialist um, intention or, 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 or background, motivation, maybe. Well, I think the real problem here is, uh, to the, is the extent to which uh, preservation is done for uh, the heritage tourism market. Okay. And, um, here, in this case, what makes this case so special, uh, I think, is the openness within this, with which this is admitted. Uh, there's no hesitation. There's no um, game of uh, presenting uh, preservation as an enlightenment project. Mm -hmm. There's no game of presenting it as a care or concern project, and maybe in the words of Heidegger. Uh, right. No, it's all plain. We want to make money out of this. Uh, how do we make it uh, attractable? Uh, attra sorry, attractive to uh, people to people with money, Western tourism, Western tourists, and then uh, for that, certain modifications uh, have to be done. Uh, and thus, those modifications have to be planned based on the available statistic data. Um, no. Which is not from there, but is a, is already. So, do you see a parallel um, thing? Because because the tourism's were the, the, the to be attracted tourists were Western. That then you can say that was that an explicit justification also to use data that's not local, but but let's say foreign, or was that just because that was the data they had? Well, I think both. But I think uh, the point that I wanted to make that in Europe, uh, let's say in Italy or France. Germany too, uh, all those considerations, uh, they camouflage the uh, economic drive, the economic impulse, the commodification impulse to a large degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, usually we don't find that kind of discourse. The discourse that we encounter when we uh, study uh, the documentation for the preservation of a small, a small town in Italy would be much more humanistic. Mm -hmm. uh, it would, you, you would hear things like, uh, that's our common heritage, we're a nation, we uh, uh, need to, uh, let's say the central government needs to help for the care uh, uh, of those monuments, uh, so uh, much more ideological. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, that ideological camouflage is, is much more there, and mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so uh, is what is actually going on there. Is that similar to the colonial experience? Yes, I think it's fundamentally mm -hmm. similar, but we don't see it that uh, vividly. Our optics is distorted. Uh, by uh, the other discourses that also um, uh, that are a lot more present. 
right yeah. like it, so so that the, the culture let's say the cultural or seemingly cultural discourse of legacy or, or heritage yeah. Yeah. um yeah yeah kind of covers up because in in a way um if if we were to say okay i mean you 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 started with um saying that this is not let's say mainly or explicitly a critique of of these practices as colonialist practices but of course that's that's there because did did they ever your actors did they ever because they were so openly talking about making this fit for a kind of tourist as a tourist destination did they ever talk about um something let's say um similar to the to backs and dolls that period i that we that that it's that we cannot even get to a certain so was the goal ever to get to a certain authentic reconstruction of anything or re preservation of anything or was that was it so clear that that was not on the table that it was immediately a kind of restore to something else project were there discussions about this or was it was it clear not that so much uh, they were aiming at conserving uh the um um at conserving this uh, the material um uh, like shell in a sense mm -hmm. of oriental life but mm -hmm. without letting that oriental quote unquote life to explode there in the moment of modernization and the moment of demographic transition mm -hmm. to destroy this shell. Right. So it's a bit like maybe um, like a snail. So they wanted to, the shell of the snail to be there, but then they were afraid that the actual muscle within it is like growing too fast and might destroy it. Right. So what can be done about it? Yeah. The, the, yeah. The, they were searching for that sort of a solution. And then obviously they had certain, uh, not sorry, it's not obvious, by the way. Uh, they had certain uh, expectations that uh, the medieval underground uh, town of Accra, that Crusaders Accra, will be eventually excavated and will become uh, the object of tourist destination, which it eventually became mm -hmm. under the state of Israel, uh, as I mentioned. But um, that came second because they really did not know how much is the underground. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, they might have, and they had hopes that there is a lot underground, but uh, there were, those were just only hopes. Not yet verified, but a kind of impulse to 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 protect before because that's I mean in a way that's the kind of struggle that's behind this that there's a I mean as you as you've shown because you could one can ask if if not every culture should be granted the right to preserve and destruct its own heritage and where do where do where does one draw the line because it's this whole we need to we need to preserve it before they let's say mm -hmm. destroy it themselves so it's like it's a kind of um yeah, I mean cultural interference anyway, but but a but a question of how far we would disentangle these kind of. Um, yeah, no, I see you're trying to make me answer this question. I'm trying to avoid answering. I know you're trying not to answer. I know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Maybe this this year is talking to the historian. That might be. I could take on a different role, but we might also. Um, do you? I mean, if you want to answer, I I will let you answer. But if you don't want to answer, we can let other people ask questions. I will try to answer. Okay. I, I say you want me to answer, so I will try to answer. Um, now I do think that uh, local heritage uh, belongs uh, to the local communities. Yeah. Even though uh, many people will say uh, it's not exactly the case, and if local communities like think of. Um, Obvious Marbles, example of Taliban of yeah, yeah. Uh, that is a local community, but then it goes ahead and destroys valuable uh, cultural monuments. Well, the other, the reverse situation when de facto uh, monuments are confiscated from local communities and yeah. managed and ruled and restored and adjusted to the taste of uh, the supposedly enlightened uh, custodians from outside is a lot more common. Yeah. And uh, that's actually a problem that we don't like to talk about as much as we like to talk about uh, the atrocities of Taliban, but that's something to also be looked at. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's where my question went. Thank you. Um, I think we have questions. I mean, the first one I see is from uh, Friederike and then uh, Lisa Beisman. Also Friederike Lausch. And, and if you ask a question, just switch on your camera so Igor can see who's talking to him. I think that's helpful. Yes, hello. Hello again. <laughs> um, so may I ask why or where does come your motivation to look at Acre? And um, is this case study an exception or is it like the standard um, procedure? Or I, I would like to know more about the context of your own research and also about this case study. I'm generally interested in uh, preservation under colonial conditions in the colonial context. Uh, that's something that I wrote my dissertation about. That's, by the way, a course that I teach at Anna Maria Maestro's chair uh, this semester. Uh, uh, so I was, I am looking for those sorts of um, case studies because they allow me to build, hopefully, a three dimensional picture of how different types of colonial authorities function under different uh, economic conditions. Because you see in Palestine, there was, well, the British empire during World War II was considerably impoverished. It uh, essentially failed its war with Germany uh, and um, uh, was pushed to the limits of its economic sustainability, if you wish. Uh, and then it was, uh, coming up with uh, different sorts of projects, as you see in this case of Accra, uh, that hopefully after the war is over would allow it to rebuild its economy. Uh, that's a very unusual case, a very special case, uh, because in other cases, you look at, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Britain, British India in, uh, let's say, uh, late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, and um, you see that the driving forces behind preservation, they were completely different. Or uh, you look at the Russian Empire in Central Asia, which I did for my dissertation, different uh, reasons. You look at Khedival Egypt, which was sort of semi-colonial, in semi-colonial relationships with, again, the British Empire, again, different situation. So I am just interested in those cases. And when I found that uh, data, the archival materials, I was just excited. It's new, absolutely new thing, something that I haven't seen. And again, you can comment a little bit on also what the French were doing in uh, North Africa. They had their own uh, reasons. Uh, much more ideological, by the way, uh, for the preservation or mm. re reconstruction of heritage in, let's say, Algeria. Again, so uh, it's not a coincidence. It's not something that, um, from that perspective, that, that's just the scope of my research interests in, in general. Uh, now, uh, is that common for uh, British Palestine? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, more archival research for that is needed. I was already fairly happy that I found that material. Uh, but he is constantly referring, uh, pursuant, pursuant is referring uh, to Jerusalem and the experience with preservation uh, of monuments in Jerusalem. So I would assume I've, uh, something similar, uh, or along the similar lines at least, was done to Jerusalem, because he has that point for comparison. Uh, is, does that answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> then I will hand over to Lisa. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks so much uh, for sharing your uh, research and for sharing this super interesting case. Um, I had a similar question to, to Frederica's, um, so maybe I can kind of follow up because I was also interested in how you came across this particular um, case. And since we are, um, we plan to talk a little bit about um, methods and, and like ongoing research processes, maybe you can talk a little about um, your actual field work and how, like where, where you actually came across this material. 
um, and a more um, like content question um, or maybe comment. I, I, I thought it was really interesting to introduce tourism as a factor or, or the, the, um, the construction or, or the building up of tourism as a factor in preservation um, or as a factor for preservation. Um, and I, I was wondering, but yeah, maybe you, you said something in this direction, but that um, introducing tourism to the area wouldn't only be about earning money, but but also to yeah implicitly stabilize or I don't know historicize, maybe also exoticize and and kind of tame through these processes to like tame the the actual processes, um, social processes going on in the area. So I think tourism um, and like the, the question of agency of the local population, I thought oh, this is really interesting and maybe even more could be made out of um, this topic. But my actual question um, was about the, the field work. Mm -hmm. All right, so I was uh, working for is an in, in, internship as an intern work, working for Israeli Antiquities Authority, had access to the archives, and I uh, was just going through lots of raw data uh, and looking at uh, what they have and uh, uh, reading uh, their uh, archive, their folders and uh, trying to see if there is anything interesting going on, not just uh, from the perspective of like attribution or dating, but uh, from the perspective of um, uh, theoretical considerations that uh, were like a foundation for a future development. In the case of Accra, what is interesting is that as I mentioned, there was a dramatic shift in its history around 1948. But then uh, when the state of Israel more or less became stable, stabilized, they returned to the same project, essentially. Uh, just a little bit modified, as I already mentioned, by showing uh, the uh, underground structures preserved from the Crusaders period. But essentially, uh, Aqua was not, or Akana was not developed as a, uh, an industrial center like Haifa across the bay, but is that sort of cute tourist place uh, for people to visit. Um, so those materials are not completely relevant. The, uh, they are actively used now in the process of, tour, uh, in the process of tourist adaptation of Accra, and uh, they have still they, they preserve some practical importance, but not exactly the the kind of demographic planning. The demographic planning, no one uh, in Israel is looking at that now because the dynamics are completely different. But more uh, the visual documentation and the that kind of. Um, yeah, that kind of data. And now, uh, methodologically, to what extent tourism accounts for um, objectification or uh, uh, perhaps orientalization of, um, uh, of uh, local communities, it certainly does. Uh, and not just in the Middle East, uh, almost everywhere in developing countries, people who come to from developed countries or from um, local industrial centers or financial centers who come to visit those smaller communities for tourist purposes, for the purposes of cultural tourism, they have almost always certain set expectations about what they're going to find. And uh, those expectations have to be provided. And uh, that obviously results in the creation of fake identities, or not exactly fake, but more like um, pre-designed identities. Uh, I came across that in Mexico, I came across that in Ecuador, I came across that in uh, South Korea, all, the, all play, those places that were possible to visit before, two years ago still. In the before times. 
Yeah. Um, Sebastiano Fabrini has a question, and then um, Daniela Ortiz dos Santos has a question, but doesn't have a hand to raise. So let's do Sebastiano and then Daniela. Hi, I, I cannot start my video. Um, it's all right. Let's see. Okay, I'll do it without without video. Well, thank you so much for for the presentation and for uh, for sharing your research. It was really interesting. Uh, I have a, a quick comment and then a question. Uh, first of all, um, I thought the the point that you made uh, towards the end of the presentation about uh, how uh, demographic decline actually helps or contributes to uh, tourism was really interesting and, and eye-opening for me. Uh, I come from Italy, and in Italy, we often look at the issue of demographic decline in small historic towns as a problem. But actually, from that perspective of international tourism, it's not a problem. It's something that helps that dynamic uh, in a strange, weird way. The presence of a local population is something that actually um, uh, makes tourism more difficult if you look at if you look at it from that perspective. So that was that was really an interesting point. Um, and then I have a question about um, the sort of the turning point of uh, 1948 uh, when the British left and the state of Israel was established. I thought that was a, kind of an interesting turning point. Um, I guess that the issue of historic preservation and tourism uh, may not have been the, the primary concern in the early phase of the nation building process in Israel. Uh, but um, I guess the question is, did the, the Israeli authorities in the late 40s and in the 50s uh, maintain uh, some of those practices that the British established as it pertained to uh, the, the preservation of all towns, or was there a, a change of pace, a change of approach uh, towards preservation? Well, thank you for your comment. And uh, for the question, um, when, if we are talking about the former, former but Arab towns or Ottoman towns in uh, in coastal Palestine. Uh, and for a while, uh, there wasn't much care uh, given to them by the state of Israel. Uh, was not, it's not like they wanted to get rid of them, but uh, was just not the priority. The priority was uh, establishing uh, the uh, heroic narrative perhaps of uh, uh, the return of Jewish presence in Palestine and all the continuity of Jew Jewish presence in Palestine. So uh, the focus were places like Masada, uh, where uh, people like Yegeli Adin uh, were uh, creating essentially the new mythology of the state of Israel, which by the way now is, well, in the last decades is criticized by Israeli intellectuals themselves. No one takes that seriously anymore. But at that time, that was the real focus of, uh, if you call that preservation activities. And then obviously uh, massive archeological excavations to uh, around the whole uh, Palestine or the territories that uh, Israel controlled different periods of its history. And, but then, with uh, progressive integration of Israel in the system of global capitalism, starting from uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, those co coastal Arab coastal towns became an asset. They start to be seen as an asset and uh, more and attracted more attention. Like Yaf, for instance, uh, essentially a suburb of. Um, Tel Aviv was the first, and uh, Arca was also among, among the more important instances. Yeah. Then we'll move to Daniela and her question. Thank you for the question. Hi, Igor. Thank you very much. I also have, um, uh, let's say, 
uh, a question uh, on your uh, also research methods and also on on your research approach. Um, I would like to uh, know if, uh, for example, you've examined uh, the discourses and practices established by UNESCO. Of course, we have questions of asynchronity because UNESCO is from 45 on, but we'll say if we consider United Nations, uh, I mean, the discussions already and, uh, and all the debates even with UNESCO, so pre-UNESCO, but also especially after UNESCO, how was this and all the, let's say, through your approach on the colonial, let's say, also intersections established in such international, uh, transnational, uh, let's say, organizations, uh, was it for you uh, something to be considered? And uh, uh, what could you, for example, uh, search had chance to go through material produced by UNESCO or if as an institutional approach, if it was interest to compare, intersect and uh, review contradictions or <laughs> because it's, I think it's quite an interesting, uh, let's say you mentioned things on internet or heritage and tourism and this has been an issue very much if we study the history of, of UNESCO itself and of moment, I mean you probably are very aware of uh, Lucia Ale's uh, uh, work and so on. How this is for you? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I am indeed aware of Lucia's work and I talked to her a number of times about her research and uh, she, her book, I uh, assigned it to my students. So um, oh, chapters from it. Uh, so uh, it is an important uh, an important set of problems how um, global uh, appreciation for uh, heritage emerged uh, how is it linked to colonialism is it linked to colonialism yes it is I believe uh, how uh, the uh, uh, World Heritage List was populated initially. Uh, what are the criteria for the World Heritage List? Uh, to what extent we can take seriously uh, its claims that the monuments included there reflect, how do they put it, uh, the uh, masterpieces of human creative genius. I think that's the first criteria uh, of the World Heritage List, uh, or rather, uh, the uh, if we take it, if, if we try to be more critical, the, perhaps it's more of uh, the Western European North American cultural expectations that they reflect rather than the uh, world, rather than the, the, the human creative genius. It's, um, it is something that I, I am aware of and that's something that I uh, try to approach critically in my research. If that particular case did not quite reflect it, it's because I'm perhaps too fascinated with this material and how uh, demography uh, or really the demographic engineering uh, becomes an instrument of preservation or more, no, not, not so much even preservation, but staging the monument, making a monument into something immediately recognizable and something easy uh, to consume, uh, something uh, accessible. Uh, because uh, you can imagine if uh, we come to a, a society which is torn apart by social pro problems, uh, it would be much hard, a lot harder to uh, appreciate monuments which the society controls. And it's uh, in that way moderated, um, it's easy. So yes, but uh, 
I guess in, in general that works along the same lines, uh, but that is certain also certain uh, interesting questions which are specific to the colonial situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Thank you, Daniela. I don't have any more questions in the list as far as I can see. So unless someone has an urgent request um, or question, uh, then we can, of course, accommodate that. Otherwise, Igor is available. So if you have questions, you sleep tonight, you can't fall asleep because you keep thinking about this presentation and you have a question, I'm sure you can email him. Uh, he's around. Um, and um, Friederike, do you want to say some closing words about the next um, talk or do we just conclude here and hope that everybody um, dials in again for the next round? Yes, I would say we conclude here. Then thanks everybody for coming to our first CCSA talk. Um, the next is on um, November 25th, I think, also at 2 p.m with Christiane Fischer's book launch. So um, see you there, I would say. And thank you, Igor, again. Mm -hmm.